Welcome to Bitcoin Fixes This, where we explore the impact that Bitcoin will have in all aspects of society. The impact that Bitcoin will have in all aspects of society. Today's guest is Stefan Levera, Bitcoin podcaster, speaker, and Austrian economist. We talk about how fiat money has changed the workplace and how Bitcoin changes the nature of work. Stefan also tells us his story of how he went from financial auditor to Bitcoin podcaster and what he sees with the industry going forward. How are you doing? Jimmy, I'm doing great. Thank you very much for the very flattering introduction. <laughs> you're, you're being way too humble, but, uh, but we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. Because in a sense, I, I want to explore all of these topics uh, uh, about how you got to the level of knowledge that you have. Because you know, as a developer, when I hear you talk, it's, uh, it's kind of amazing just how deep a knowledge you have of the technical stuff. Uh, and not only that, but also the economic aspect. Can you tell us more about how you got into that? Of course, man. So look, I was like most, we were taught, you know, just you kind of grow up thinking the typical, what you think is typical moderate views. I would say my parents were a little bit more on the slightly conservative side, um, but they weren't like hardcore conservatives. And going through school, you just kind of get taught this kind of progressive narrative of things. And I, at, at a young age, when I was maybe 14 or 15, I was hanging out in IRC channels. And I went to one channel called Oz Politics, right? Australian politics. And there was this character there who kept linking to Mises Daily articles. And he kept talking about anarcho-capitalism. And I was like, what? No, no way. Like, that doesn't work. How how would society work? Like, we there would be gangs and there would be, you know, there'd be violence on the streets. How You can't believe that. That doesn't make sense. And what happened is over time, as we discussed different issues, it actually started to make more sense to me about this whole concept of Austrian economics. How would a free market deal with things? How would a free market deal with education, with health, with all the, you know, basically everything that we need, you know, as humans in our daily lives. And so that made so much more sense to me than the things that I was learning at school, right? And so there was just like this consistency about it, about the way you apply this this reasoning and this method of thinking, right? The praxeological method. Now, at that time, I was too young to sort of understand why, right? But it was just one of those things where it just intuitively made so much more sense to me because it just you know it was just like you can you actually consider the seen and the unseen like we consider like okay what would the counterfactual be if i were to do it the other way what would have happened and you and that's kind of that's how you think like an economist and so that for me was started off my journey of going down that the austrian economics rabbit hole right this is well before bitcoin mm -hmm. uh and mm. so then i went down that pathway of becoming more of a libertarian and so then you know pretty much was you know i was into you know ron paul and mises and rothbard and all these guys um i was reading their work you know during uh i would say my late high school and early uni years university years and so then i just already had that fundamental grounding of what is austrian economics and ha being a fan of the school of thought it was only natural when uh you know, you come across Bitcoin and it's presented to you in the right way that that it just all makes so much more intuitive sense to you. Now, just like most, the first time I heard about Bitcoin, it was probably, I can't remember exactly when, but it probably was a, like a Slashdot article from, you know, 2011 or 2012, something like that. But for me, my moment of coming into it was an Eric Voorhees article, funnily enough. So I mm. was... On a family holiday in Sri Lanka with my family uh, back there, and we I was just bored and scrolling and found an article, and it was one of Eric Voorhees' articles from I, you know, I, I believe he wrote that article in like earlier in 2012, but I read it in December 2012. And when I heard the Eric Voorhees explanation of it, that was it. From then on, I was just like, wow, this thing can actually challenge central banks, and it will actually, uh, well, potentially, right? Uh, it could potentially change the way we all interact from a monetary point of view and that will have so many more downstream impacts into our lives into how we work into what industries are profitable and how we you know and just how we interact you know like the importance of family and community and all of these different things where it empowers the individual and it 
takes power away from the state. And so that was why, obviously, I was so interested in this idea. And at that point, I just, you know, wanted to, you know, go and read everything and everything I could find. I went, obviously, read the white paper and read all the, you know, and at, in those days, I was reading, you know, the subreddit r slash Bitcoin, and I would also lurk on the Bitcoin talk forums. And that was, you know, that was how I sort of first got into Bitcoin and started reading and learning about Bitcoin. And then and then in 2013 and 14 days, that was when I was, you know, reading the Nakamoto Institute and I was interacting with Pierre online back then, back in those days, right? And that was how I first, wow. you know, quote unquote, met Pierre and Michael. And so that was, yeah, that was kind of how I came into Bitcoin. Wow. Um, so what were you doing at that time? What was your day job? Right. So I studied commerce and I went and trained as a chartered accountant. So most of my career professionally before Bitcoin was actually as an internal auditor. So what an internal auditor does is, for anyone who doesn't know, essentially you are, think of it like you're assessing the risks and controls within a business. And it's it's all about assessing the controls of a business and essentially coming to a view in terms of providing assurance to the business on a certain thing. Now, some of that is financial in nature sometimes, and other times it's more about operational risks that the business may face. So I studied commerce and I also actually did information systems as well. I was always a little bit more of a tech savvy guy as opposed to the typical straight accountant type. Um, so I I guess that's potentially, that gave me a little bit more of a an ability to try and read and understand a little bit further into the technical aspects than, uh, than let's say, the average Joe on the street kind of person. Um, and so I started off after uni at Deloitte, which was one of those big professional consulting and internal audit companies. Right? Well, I was in the internal audit division. Obviously, they have a lot of different divisions. And so, yeah, that was most of – so I, that's where I got my start. And then over my career – in terms of internal audit and being a chartered accountant, which for the US people that's equivalent is the CPA, basically. So I spent a lot of time inside of banks also because I was doing internal audit inside banks as later in my career. And so I got more of a picture of how it really works inside the banks. And I think to some extent that also gave me exposure in terms of how things work from a quote unquote financial crime perspective, right? So understanding how things look inside the bank when they're looking at things like AML and sanctions and so on and some of these different controls and just banking like at a retail banking level particularly. And also I did actually do a little bit of work in IT audit as well. So yeah, so I guess professionally that's uh, how, what I was doing, but obviously on the side, I had all, all through that time I was interested in Austrian economics and Bitcoin. So what was looking through bank audits uh, and things like that like? What what was surprising to you about that whole industry? And how did your perspective, especially as an Austrian economist, more or less, sort of color how you saw what you saw? Oh, great question. I would say one thing there is as a student of Austrian economics, we have an awareness of the Cantillon effect, right? Meaning those people closest to the monetary spigot get the benefit and those people further away suffer. And so to some extent, I had actually had some hangups about going and joining financial services because in some ways I felt a bit like, oh, is that really right? But in some, I guess the, the counter argument would be don't hate the player, hate the game, Right. It's more like people who understand the system know how to benefit from that system. And I knew that working inside financial services is one way to put myself closer to the monetary spigot, right? And so translate that into English, typically people who work in financial services will have higher salaries than other sectors, right? Just because that, that is where some of the new money is first created, right? You're closer to the spigot. And so I had, like, I guess from that perspective, I did have some slight hang up, but I thought, well, you know what? Yeah, it's don't hate the player, hate the game, right? The system is here. I can't, you know, I can't directly change it. Uh, but, you know, that's that's part of why, you know, it's a good idea to go work in financial services uh, yeah, or construction or any of these industries that get the new credit first, right? Um, but, yeah, I mm. guess just generally looking into banking and being part of an audit team, you see more and more of the the inside of the beast, as it were, and you see how banks essentially live in fear of their regulator, right? They live in fear of having their banking license stripped from them. And so that is, 
interesting because then you start to see how there's all these different, for example, depending on how big the bank is, obviously, but typically big banks will have large compliance departments. And if you are in the audit team, you might go and interact with those compliance departments because sometimes you're auditing them, you're checking them. Uh, And in other cases, you might be, there are times where, let's say, I went out to audit some retail bank branches. I'd be assessing, you know, user access reviews and looking at, okay, d- d- is there a process around, you know, start setting up the access for a new user, changing that access for a new user or terminating, right? If a, if a user leaves that role or leaves the bank, what's the controls around mm-hmm. that? So that's kind of how an internal auditor is typically thinking and looking at different aspects and trying to understand where are the risks, what are the controls that this business has in place? Um, but yeah, I guess bring it back to kind of the regulation and the government and things like that. I, I definitely sensed that many aspects of the business get deputized by government regulators. So for example, government regulators might come out with some guideline and say, oh, this is, this is the correct way that, you know, the bank must, um, look after customers. And then that sets the tone for all kinds of policies, all kinds of, uh, materials. And oftentimes the regulator doesn't, necessarily have staff themselves or they might have a very small team so they'll kind of push that cost onto banks right and so this you'll see this and that is why internally inside the bank it's sort of like in some quasi sense you end up working for the regulator sometimes uh and to Mm. the customer then it can look like oh man there's all these regulations there's all these rules and you know it's 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 stifling right and this is you know, I think it, we can consider this, right, like as a free market libertarians, we can approach this from the perspective of saying, well, what kind of controls would exist in a free market, right? And obviously, there would be some level of controls put in place that businesses put in place to obviously restrict their losses or to protect their customers and things like that. But I think overly, what we see when when you have the regular regulators come in is they will sort of come in and put in more of like a one size fits all approach or they'll they'll try to <laughs> look at things that successful businesses are doing and then go around saying every other business has to do that too right and that and it, when it may not necessarily be correct but depending on the situation because again it's like a bureaucratic mindset as opposed to actually putting a little bit more trust into the discretion of the manager of a certain department and so on uh, yeah, there's a few different ways where you can sort of assess what's going on inside that business or that bank or whatever and kind of understand, well, what would it look like if it weren't for this regulation or you know, fiat money? Even? Yeah, it's it's interesting. What, what, you, what you said reminds me of something about the financial services industry that's always a little bit like odd if you look at it is that a lot of financial service industry people tend to be very, very conservative. Like they're uh, not very quick to buy anything. Uh, they always take forever to make any kind of decision. Um, but, you know, like w- the way you describe it, it sounds like government regulation sort of forces them to kind of take on that sort of personality where they sort of try to minimize risk as much as possible in some directions, at least with regard to regu- regulatory stuff, but not in the other direction, which is uh, actually like the loans that they make out and stuff, as long as they fit whatever one size fits all guideline, they they seem to be okay with that. Would that be a fair assessment? Yeah, so it's a difficult, yeah. So broadly, I would say yes, but it's kind of, it's the way I, I think of it also is that if we really zoom out and think about what fiat money does, is it just creates this overall environment where, you know, it's much easier for an entrepreneur to get this cheap credit. And that's what enables this kind of zombie businesses to exist or these businesses that kind of benefit massively from scale. And that is why I think we are seeing, especially now during this whole coronavirus panic, is big businesses winning at the expense of small businesses. And that really, you know, that, that, yeah, that kind of annoys me and frustrates me because it, you know, it essentially, it creates these, these more meaningless jobs in some way because it creates more of a a sense of distance from the actual end consumer whereas i'm sure you you know even from your own personal life uh, that typically the smaller businesses are the ones that actually have more of a connection with their customer and typically not always obviously there's exceptions but 
typically the people working in small businesses feel more of a sense of meaningfulness around what they do uh, compared to, you know, people in like these kind of huge megacorps, right? Why do you think that is? Uh, I mean, you, you obviously worked in a larger place. Now you're sort of doing your own thing. Like from your perspective, what's the difference? Why, why is it so much more meaningful to make your own stuff? I think part of it, well, look, part of it is also when you have your own name and your own brand on it, then it feels a lot more, you have a lot more skin in the game, right? If it's the Stefan Levera podcast or if it's, you know, Jimmy Song's <laughs> book, then it, obviously you kind of really feel it more when someone comes to you and says, oh, hey, man, I really enjoyed reading your book or I really enjoyed listening to your podcast or whatever because it just feels so much more closer to you. One thing that I noticed is that many people in corporate Australia, and I'm sure this probably applies elsewhere around the world, where people coming uh, sort of felt more of a distance and they felt like they were just a cog in the machine, right? Now, look, Mm. in fairness, this isn't true for everyone. Like I'm sure there are some people who really, you know, they get up and they really love it and that's their, you know, that's their passion. Um, But I, I, my sense of it was that there were many people who felt that way and they had been sort of stifled in a, in a, in some way they had been kind of pushed into a certain box if you will around how the you know the correct way to interact and everything's got to be kind of you know kind of a certain pc kind of political correctness aspects that you couldn't really be yourself right whereas if you talk to someone who works in a more quote unquote blue collar job let's say like someone who's like a tradesman and they they're kind of joking around on the site with their other mates on the site and they kind of, you know, they might make some very un-PC jokes with each other, <laughs> right? And that's like the typical thing of like, you know, the stereotype, right? But, you know, there's almost more of a sense of, uh, you know, just less feeling. You're putting feeling more of a in. box or something like that? Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, well, so speaking of that, I, do do you feel like uh, what, what, what do you attribute that to? Do you think it, it really is fiat money that sort of, puts people in these like small or, or like very limited roles uh, that and kind of like the regulations you were describing where it's sort of like one size fits all and you have to do it this particular way. That seems to be a pattern, not just with regulations, but with the actual jobs that are out there uh, in large companies. Uh, like, how would you characterize why that is in a large company? So I think part of that is just Fiat money has driven this kind of expansion in the size of the government. That expansion in the size of the government has also led to a lot more regulations. And in order to survive in this kind of high regulation environment, there's a big benefit towards big business there because who else can afford the army of lawyers and accountants and compliance professionals and even audit staff, to be fair, Who else can afford that? Mm. Well, it's only big businesses. And then what happens in these big businesses is you get this very bureaucratic environment. And so I think now this isn't true in all businesses, obviously, but I think there's just a tendency there. And I think if it weren't for this negative and deleterious effects of fiat money, I don't believe the state and the regulations of the state would be so heavy and so large that would enable the existence of more smaller and medium enterprises and those smaller and medium. And then look, of course, there would still be some massive businesses because in today's global economy, you need some that are just at a huge scale. And that's totally fair. That's totally fine. I think it's more just like the way things have grown and the way things have been pushed. We've been, it's almost like humanity was on this pathway or we could have been on this pathway, but we've been pushed onto a more negative pathway, in my view, because of fiat money and because of the expansion of the state. And people don't really realize it, right? Because if you talk to the typical person, they don't understand how much of an impact the government and regulations have on their business or maybe they narrowly see it only in whatever field they work in but they don't see it at a broader macro level this is the impact of massive statism and massive regulation so i think that's just yeah i think that's kind of the way and I, an, an interesting point that we're seeing as well is in in some ways entrepreneurs no longer serve consumers but they often serve lenders right so if we were to think mm. about what what would the typical fiat money world look like versus say a sound money world let's say we lived under a gold or a bitcoin standard well we would live under a world where there was more equity and less debt and because everyone now is taking so on so much more debt either because they see that there's a massive benefit by leveraging up or because they need to compete with other businesses which do have access 
right? Because again, it's like a don't hate the player, hate the game, right? If your competitor has access to cheap credit, well, then you kind of need to also partake in the cheap credit uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> debacle because otherwise you'll lose out against them or it might be difficult and you're operating at a disadvantage. But then what happens when everyone is now in debt? Well, to some extent, you have to now serve your lender as well, not just your consumer, right? So, for example, banks have covenants and certain conditions in place that you must meet. And in some ways, bankers end up becoming the entrepreneur. And the entrepreneur, what we think of as the entrepreneur, is really kind of more like a well-paid executive, right? They're kind of (laughs) <laughs> you know, they're kind of a manager as opposed to the owner in some in some cases, right? Or it's it's kind of it's pushing in that direction. It's not a hundred percent that way. So then, mm-hmm. typically, you know, I think what you'll see is like the the true entrepreneur tends to be in the smaller businesses. That it, it tends to be family businesses, and those smaller businesses tend to care more for their employees than, let's say, the puppets of a banker, right? <laughs> <laughs> right and you know it's it just and i would say on the whole this credit springing from fiat inflation it it provides this financial edge and it encourages reckless behavior of chief executives because you know it just it's it's cheap to get the debt and you can uh you you know and that's why and that's why we see this kind of joke of some of these companies that just keep surviving through new rounds of funding new rounds of vc funding rather than actually just genuinely being a profitable business right what what you were talking when you were talking about uh sort of like yeah, even like startup founders being almost like executives that's totally correct cuz like it, we see this in the vc world where you know, if you're a founder that's had some success before, it's a lot easier to raise money uh, than if you're, you know, and, you know, you're aiming obviously to be a unicorn instead of like some lifestyle business that could be very profitable. None, none of those guys ever really get funded, which is very strange, um, you know, given that everyone should be really out for profit. Um, but uh, with regard to uh, sort of like how people behave at work, right? Like, um, uh, it, it, it is interesting that uh, you're bringing up like how they're kind of restricted in their freedom and uh, ultimately the executives end up serving the lenders um, in a way that seems to filter down to all of the employees because, I mean, you look at workplace satisfaction surveys and so on, almost all, almost everybody that works seems like absolutely miserable compared to years past or compared to, you know, what uh, tradesmen or consultants or people that work for themselves do. Uh, in what way do you think those are related, uh, like fiat money versus sort of general happiness at work? Look, I think part of it is we are, it's like we're running on this treadmill and it's continually getting faster and faster. I think that's like the impact of inflation on most people's lives, unless you are in that top few percent where you're benefiting from it, right? And so, mm. you know, it it just becomes this really bad work-life balance. And I think um, some of your listeners might really enjoy. So for anyone who's into Bitcoin, even if you're even halfway into Bitcoin, I think you'll really enjoy the book, The Ethics of Money Production by Guido Holzman. He touches on some of this stuff in such a great way there. Um, and also Rahim Tagiza Degen, he did a book called The Zero Interest Rate Trap. He also touches on some of these ideas there. But essentially, everyone has to become an investment manager, right? Everyone has to, you know, and everyone has to continually try to, impress and continually try to I mean look it's fair it's fair that you have to keep trying to impress generally but I think they are kind of getting pushed down certain pathways and I think it wouldn't have been that way if we had if we really had you know sound money I think the the types of products people make the types of services they create and build they would be entirely different I think what we're seeing is this kind of fiat money world where the quality of products are coming down over time. A quick example of that would be things mm. like shrinkflation, right? As inflation occurs, <laughs> they start offering you, you know, less chips in that bag of chips or whatever, right? You're starting to get less for the same amount of money. And it, it just, we're not building things to last. And I think that is, some of that is just people trying to deal with the problems brought on by inflation. And sometimes entrepreneurs end up really what they end up doing is just arbitrating from the future to the present, right? So I think a good example here is something like Uber, right? So I think Mm. part of the reason Uber became so big. Now, I guess there's something good. There's some great things about Uber, obviously. But one of the things about Uber that I find 
funny is that people might think they're making money being an Uber driver, but sometimes once they account for the actual capital cost and the actual depreciation on their car, (laughs) then is it really profitable, right? And so that comes into this greater point, the broader point about capital consumption versus capital accumulation, right? Because, you know, as Austrians, we understand that the way society grows is through savings, investment, and what we call capital accumulation, right? We're building and we are expanding and being able to produce things in more and newer and better ways because of technology, because of you know beneficial growth deflation. But what happens in an inflationary environment is the accounting gets screwed up. Entrepreneurs miss that, and then they end up doing what's called capital consumption. They end up chewing down the capital stock of society in some ways, and that makes all of us, all of all of us around the world, it makes all of us poorer on the margin against what we could have had if we had sound money. And so, I think that's another example where you know it just all it, it, it the kinds of products that get ma- get made, the services that get made, you know, the work life balance that people have, the incredible focus towards making money because they're trying to keep up with the with the pace because things become you know they they get out of reach and so i think this is another aspect where i think i've I've been touching on this recently on twitter as well now this is not to attack boomers right but i think the boomer generation benefited from something very much so in a way that let's say to less of an extent generation x and then my generation the millennials and the zoomers below me that we won't be able to get that because what worked for the boomers won't work for us. And so while you could have, if a boomer could have just gone and bought stocks and bonds and property and then just sat on it for 30 years and then just made a killing out of it, that's not necessarily feasible or available for people in the younger generations. And that is, again, this is all kind of down to fiat money. We're all on this kind of treadmill that's continually running faster and faster, and it becomes really difficult for people to enjoy that kind of nice lifestyle, the promised lifestyle, you know, because it, it, it's like this incredibly increasing treadmill. Now, in fairness, some of that is perhaps people want to play status games and whatever, right? It's They would rather be the richer guy in the town as opposed to, you know, uh, or people are just trying to be, you know, richer or better than the Joneses, right? Or keeping up with the Joneses, as the saying goes. Some of that, look, in fairness, some of that is that. But I also think some of it is people have been made to focus overly on finances and trying to keep their head above water when in a sound money society, I think, the focus wouldn't be so much on that. They wouldn't. It, it's not like everyone has to become an investment manager. You know, people could just work <laughs> in their careers and have perhaps more appreciation for other things in their lives, whether that's family and community, and whether that's their, you know, their different hobbies. Yeah, there's almost like a an inflation in the amount of work that you have to do in order to just keep up with sort of that treadmill that keeps getting faster. Uh, I know, for example, that doctors used to not have to work nearly as much as they do now, in large part because they uh, kept getting their pay cut uh, through HMOs and things like that, at least in the U.S. But that seems to be a pattern with a lot of jobs around the world where you have to kind of work like a dog just to make what you were making, like what your parents' generation was making, like working 40 hours a week. Now you have to do like 50 or 60 hours a week, which... um, Seems kind of like it's from fiat. I think so. I honestly believe so. And I think it's the problem is someone listening to this, and if they're not into Austrian economics and maybe they're not into Bitcoin, they might think, oh, see, Jimmy and Stefan, they're just blaming everything on fiat money. You know, those guys, are like, they're just like one track mind. They, they can't really, like, I can understand that, right? But I really believe that a lot of it comes from the expansion of the state and the expansion of the regulations that have made it more costly. So, quick example. If you look here in Australia and prep, I don't know, in the US, maybe this is similar, but in Australia, for example, what happens is unions and regulations kind of come in and they make it difficult for, say, childcare, for example. You know, it becomes more and more expensive to get childcare. It, it, you know, now they've said you need to have like a uni degree to be able to do childcare. You can obviously imagine what that does to the cost or to, you know, to, um, if you want to, let's say people have kids here in Sydney and if they want to find a childcare place, that's really difficult. They've got to find, they've got to get in a wait line. And obviously, what does this do? It pushes up the cost of having a nanny, right? Whereas, you know, imagine 20 or 30 years ago, people would just pay the neighbor, the next door, you know, let's say the the boy or the girl next door, they're like 15 or 16 or whatever, and they would pay them to just babysit their kid, right? 
Uh, whereas now that would be like illegal and whatever. It's like it, they, they're wow. All these, I can't believe that's illegal. <laughs> yeah, like it's like. <laughs> Well, I don't know. Oh, actually, in fairness, I don't know the correct legal status of that. Mm-hmm. But uh, I think the broader point is they've made it so costly because they keep putting in new regulations and licensing to say, now you need to have a working with children check and you've got to do this and that and you've got to have the degree and you've got to do it. They try to make everything into like a certain government regulated profession. What does that do? It pushes up the cost. What does that do for the average everyday, you know, Joe out there? It makes his life so much more costly. And now, yes, I, and I also believe that's also why we've seen less children, right? So I know obviously you're you're a big uh, outlier here, Jimmy. You've got a fair <laughs> few kids, but I think you probably see this as well, right? I think a big part of why people don't have as many kids nowadays as they used to before is because the cost is just so incredibly high, and so you're seeing a lot of this whole dink, right? Double income, no kids style families, or double income with maybe only one kid or two kids as opposed to more kids, because they just can't, it's just not affordable for them. Well, yeah, absolutely. And uh, and I see that all the time and people sort of like cutting back on what they like in order to be able to work more, which seems kind of crazy, especially from an Austrian perspective, because we know that work is a disutility. That's why you have to get paid for it. Um, but speaking of which, uh, you're you're now a podcaster, investor, lots of other things. Um, it seems like a complete change from what you were before. Uh, you know, doing financial and technical audits and and, and so on. Uh, so, what what was that transition like? What like how did you get into this podcasting game? Because it the skill set seems so different than what what you would uh, what you had what you were using at least uh, in your previous work. Yeah, so that's, I mean, for me, I I never intended for this to become my full-time job, right? For me, it just, <laughs> I just, you know, in terms of why did I start the podcast, I was frustrated with the quality of the information out there at the time. At the time, there weren't that many high-quality resources. Obviously, you were out there, you are putting some good stuff out there. There was Noted, there was Tales from the Crypt, and there was, I mean, there were a couple others, but there was just a lot of confusion, and that was so frustrating to me. I, I, so I essentially wanted to scratch my own itch. I was basically saying, well, fine, I'll go and make the show that I would want to listen to if I were not the podcast host myself, right? As a Bitcoiner, right? Mm-hmm. Just, and at that point, mm-hmm. I was just working my normal job and just stacking, right? And I was obviously interested in some of this stuff and I was chatting with the guys, um, but I wasn't as, you know, actively producing material in the space, right? Um, so yeah, so then I basically end up spending all my spare time just doing the podcast, right? Because I was working my main job and doing the podcast on the side. And I just eventually, I guess I just, I just reached a point where it made sense for me to just do the podcast full time because I had, I was getting requests to come and speak at conferences. I was getting requests for people who wanted to sponsor the podcast. And then at that time, the Mm. bank I was working in, they had again, all this compliance and ticking and bashing that you have to do. And you had to like apply for all these forms and do all this, this, that, and the other and jump through hoops (laughs) to try and get approval to go speak at a conference or to go and have a sponsor on the show and things like that. And they just constantly kept putting up all these barriers and eventually it just reached a point where it just, okay, it's time to just let the let that career go and just focus on doing Bitcoin stuff. And I think now it's interesting you say as well, because it is a different skill set, right? Learning how to interview. Uh, but I think in some ways mm-hmm. I, I, I was building the skill set without knowing it. Right. So in some ways I, I, you know, mm. I was studying Austrian economics for a long time. I've been into Bitcoin for a long time. So I was always following the discussion around Bitcoin. Uh, and, you know, I think, it's funny now that I am a professional, professionally, I am a podcaster. I remember back to some of my earlier school days where I, I remember a teacher saying, oh, yeah, Stefan, you always ask good questions. So I think perhaps that was, <laughs> um, you know, I kind of had that skill set to begin with, but I just never really utilized it. Now, obviously, I had to learn a lot of different things, right? I had to learn a little bit about audio production. I had to learn a little bit about how to market a show and how to, you know, make it work. Um, but I guess those are all things that we just had to learn along the way. And so I think there's been some frustration in recent years about the quality of the media that we had in the whole Bitcoin and quote unquote crypto space, uh, where people felt like the kinds of questions that were being asked or the kinds of coverage that was being offered offered was not at the right level. It wasn't going to the right depth or it wasn't or it was coming from this kind of weird perspective where maybe 
they would ask the questions almost from a very statist and normie perspective. Whereas, <laughs> you know, we obviously as Bitcoiners, we have a certain view and look, not everyone agrees with us on that view, right? I'm, I understand not everybody is an anarcho-capitalist libertarian coming from the Austrian school of thought. Uh, but I think it offered another voice that was not available at the time, or at least kind of, there wasn't kind of a consistent, you know, voice of that. And I think to some extent, to the extent that my podcast has been successful, it's probably partially because of that and partially just because I go to a certain level of depth in the interviews uh, that uh, people weren't able to get elsewhere. So I think that has just been a journey for me of learning about um, you know, obviously it's a continual learning journey, right? I'm always learning with Bitcoin. There's just so many different things you have to learn and stay on top of, uh, but that's all part and parcel and that's part of the job. Yeah. And uh, one of the things I really ab- appreciate about you, Stefan, is, uh, is you do really ask good questions, but not only just like uh, good questions. You're also sort of representing that uh, that libertarian perspective and things that are important to libertarians, like privacy and uh, you know, well, how exactly are you going to get that? And you you have more of a skeptical um, sort of like you you actually really want to know the details instead of like say a reporter from you know the New York Times or something who doesn't really understand anything and they just want to write like. Um, you know, a clickbaitable headline or something like that. It, I, it, that. That's, I think, the strength of what what you've done. And it seems like you found, you saw that uh, gap in the market and you uh, sort of sought to fill it. Uh, and it seems you're getting financially rewarded. Would that be a fair assessment? Yeah, I think so. I think I basically, without really thinking too hard about it, I basically just found a gap and ended up filling that niche and or filling that gap in some way. I'm serving that need. And so I guess podcasting is a two-way market, right? So part of it is serving the listeners and then the other side of it is serving the advertisers. So you sort of, you have to serve both sides and provide you know, an <laughs> aspect for both of them, right? Because the sponsors are coming because they want a certain audience, right? They want to get to that particular audience. And sometimes it would be hard to get to that audience otherwise. And then the listeners are coming because, you know, they really like the way of, they like the consistency and the quality of the episodes. I guess that's, I mean, that's, that's for me, that's how I'm thinking about it. Uh, another question for you. Um, like, what would your advice be to a lot of these people that are kind of in these corporate jobs, or maybe they, they're like recently unemployed or something like that, that are into Bitcoin, that want to sort of transition to something where they have a little more freedom? What, what would your advice be to them? Yeah, this is always a difficult one because honestly, some of it is luck as well, right? Like we all like to think, oh, see, I got here because I'm so skilled. When look, the reality is some of it is luck too, right? I don't necessarily know. You know, it's like one of those things when you hear like some celebrity person or whatever, and they're like, yeah, chase your dreams, man. And it's like, hold on, there's a survival, <laughs> there's a survival bias here or like a selection bias here. You were the one who made it. And how, who are we to know if if that person, that celebrity or whoever was lucky about it, right? But I guess just bre- mm. just broadly, I would say it's it's a continual learning journey. It's a continual adaptation journey as well, right? Because the show and whatever whatever it is you're producing, it changes over time and you have to adapt and try to keep it relevant and keep it, you know, marketable for people. Uh, I am of the view that, look, not everyone necessarily has to work in Bitcoin, right? Because it's like, at the end of the day, Bitcoin is better money. That's what we believe. And so unless you have a certain skill set that makes sense with that, right? Like if you are a developer or something, then maybe it doesn't make sense, right? But now I don't want to go too hard that other way because look, there are many jobs in the Bitcoin world where, you know, they might be looking for someone who's a marketer. They might be looking for someone who can document things. They might be looking for someone who can do administration in that field. So, you know, I think we have to be wary that not everyone who likes Bitcoin will work in Bitcoin. They'll just work in whatever job they normally do and earn Bitcoin and look for ways to build it up on the side. So I think that's also something as well, speaking to that point around, you know, if, you, if you're if you unhappy in your current job or you've been laid off, I guess you, you can start a project on the side. Um, so for example, you can keep looking for your normal jobs in your normal field, but then you can start some project on the side. And I think in Bitcoin, sometimes it's like you do it for free for a while and if enough people like it, then you get paid for it, 
right? And if you look at, you know, mm-hmm. things like different projects in the space, I mean, let's say, you know, something like BTC Pay Server, which was serving a niche, right? Like Nicola Dorier and the, and the team there were setting that up and they were making it. Now they are getting funded by different entities in the space. So sometimes you have to demonstrate and prove a certain level of ability and value and then you can get paid for it um, if there's enough people out there who want what you're providing. Um, but otherwise, I mean, there are, I anticipate over this next year or two, I think we will see a lot more jobs come up directly in the Bitcoin space where you can go work in a Bitcoin company, whether that's, you know, like some hardware wallet or whether that's, you know, a, a company that's helping people buy Bitcoin or store their Bitcoin. Yeah, I think there will be opportunities coming in this space. Um, so I think it's about finding something that is not being done well and then doing the best you can to do it well. Yeah, I, one, one of the things about your podcast that uh, that I find intriguing is that you you this is something that you wanted to exist and it didn't exist, so you went ahead and did it. Um, in a sense, it's it's um, it's something that you uh, you wanted to see out in the marketplace, whereas like your previous job. Yeah, there is a need for auditing in the market space, but it's not something that people go, okay, well, that needs to happen and I'm going to be the person to do it because that's my problem. Um, it, it it seems very, like the character of it just seems very different. Like how, how would you um, describe how your motivations are different uh, in your previous job versus what you do now? Well, I think probably the best way to think of this is You've, you can have, I think of it like there's three things. There's job, career, and calling, right? So I would, I would, I would say audit was my career, uh, but I would say working on Bitcoin and, yeah, well, I mean, I don't directly work on Bitcoin, but I view my role as partly helping keep people updated on Bitcoin news and Bitcoin, uh, you know, information. So to some extent, that's become, that's like my calling, right? Because I'm just so passionate about Bitcoin, it just made sense for me to do that and so i think that's probably one difference there i think otherwise for for many people they don't necessarily have to work on their calling right on something that they are Mm. extremely passionate about and that's not the reality for everyone and you know we should be realistic about that too Um, but i think we can say it's fair to say that in a hard money or sound money world people would probably be able to get away with doing less time on work stuff and be able to spend more time on their passions and their calling, let's say, um, because I think that's that's the world we're going to be moving into as Bitcoin rises in prominence and fiat diminishes in prominence over the coming. This is a long term thing, right? I believe this is, you know, 15, 20 years type of time scale we're looking at. Yeah, so I, mean, I think what you're suggesting is that work becomes a little less important in people's lives. How do you think that sort of changes society or civilization in general? Well, I think we have been living in the progressive era, right? And so it just means over time, the government has taken over more and more and more. The government and the, and the progressives essentially have dominated education. They've dominated entertainment and Hollywood. They've dominated all these different, they've dominated uh, arguably a lot of the media as well. And so the way people are thinking about things is very kind of pushing in this favor of, oh, the government needs to manage more things. The government needs to have its finger in the pie in all these different places. When I think those of us who come from a more libertarian perspective and arguably people also from a conservative perspective believe more in the role of the family and the role of, you know, the, that, uh, the role of the community operated things that are done voluntarily, right? So we would believe more in, you know, mutual aid societies, voluntarily done welfare, right? As opposed to like the welfare state. And we would argue that, you know, you might spend more time and effort amongst your community in non-government dictated or government run things. Now, in fairness to progressives, I don't want to like totally smash them as well, because I think I think <laughs> I think progressives would also believe in that idea of like, hey, you've got to have, you know, some community and you've got to help out in your community and things like that. I just think the progressive would tend to believe in more of a government role for that or government regulation or government mm-hmm. kind of mandated um, aspects around that. Mm-hmm. Whereas I would say the libertarians and conservative types would believe in less government uh 
intervention in those things and just let the market decide those things and let the market do the education and the health and the, you know, so on. And I think boiling back to kind of bringing it back to your original question, I think we would probably live in a world where people, you know, work a certain amount. And obviously we're living in a deflationary environment, so we can work less if we choose to and spend more of that time doing other community things or family things. And I believe that would be a, you know, just a better outcome for more, for more people. Yeah. I, I, in a sense, I, at least for me, I, 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 I almost feel like my work isn't really, it doesn't feel like work anymore. It's, it's something that I want to do. And it's something that I'm striving to- towards, like uh, what you were t- saying about calling that, that totally jive with me. It's a, uh, it's something that I want to see the world change it towards. And, uh, and it's, it's a much a uh, longer time perspective, a uh, low time preference, if you will. Uh, I mean, can you speak to how your perspective on that has changed or uh, on the future has changed as you've, uh, you know, I guess, started working for yourself and as you've gotten into Bitcoin? Yeah, look, I think being in Bitcoin, it is very much about building up a reputation and, you know, continually delivering. And so because so much of it, your reputation really matters more in this space, especially, I think it does drive us towards being low time preference and thinking about, you know, uh, I think there was something that really touched, uh, I think, I think it was Naval who said this, he was something saying something like, I want to play long term games with long term people, right. And I think Mm. that is the I think that's very much a Bitcoin uh, that's very in line with the way typical Bitcoin people are thinking is that we're trying to think about ways to do do good for our you know partners who we trade with and our friends and um, our people who we work with and talk with uh, because we think that's the way of a civilized society and we're going to try and move towards that and uh, it's it's sort of just uh, it's like that reality uh, what's that the future is already here it's just not evenly distributed right I think <laughs> it's a bit like that like we're mm. just a lot of the Bitcoin people are just sort of taking on what we think society is going to grow into over time and because of that we are trying to act in ways that are perhaps a little bit more low time preference uh compared to the other kind of non-bitcoin world yeah yeah there there's almost like uh you know how you have to save up in order to create something really great and this is the capital accumulation but there's almost like um time accumulation or mental space accumulation so it's like accumulating things that are all uh, valuable besides money uh, that that you might need later uh, for your own happiness that seems to go along with capital accumulation. Would you say that's the effect that we're seeing? I think so. I think it's it's just a it's it's an increasing recognition of the importance of you know working together um, and trying to build something that will last. And not just, you know, capital, capital wise, but, you know, your reputation and you, you start to think a little bit more about what kind of legacy and name are you going to leave um, behind? What sort of legacy do you wish you could leave behind? Oh, I, have, I guess I haven't thought too hard about that, but I think, I mean, I, I, I guess I do think about it, but I haven't explicitly thought, okay, exactly what do I want to leave behind? I think I want to make sure that, I, you know, I, I helped when it counted, right? Like I helped, I said the right things that even if they were unpopular at the time, uh, that were kind of pulling people in the direction of giving them more individual, you know, sovereignty, right? Like I think that's really important. It's a very important thing to me, obviously to you as well. Um, being libertarians, I think it is, you know, really important that we can try to give people more power to their own lives and their own, um, lo- at the local level. And so I think, that's why, to me, I think basically stopping central banking and stopping fiat money is, I think, bang for buck wise, I think it's the most bang for buck we can get. And that is probably the best explanation for me why I'm so uh, interested in Bitcoin and interested to help promote uh, you know, useful and interesting discussions about Bitcoin and educational discussions about Bitcoin. That's really the driving factor for me. Well, all right. So and kind of a random question, but uh, five years from now, what's sort of your best case scenario for Bitcoin and what's your worst case scenario for Bitcoin? Oh, okay. So, okay. 
Best case first. So let's say, you know, we go through this like bull cycle of sometime over the next five years, right? Um, I think we will start to see at least some smaller or medium sized uh, governments that will just kind of openly accept and be more Bitcoin savvy and try to encourage Bitcoiners to come live there. Um, if we're lucky, we'll start to see some of the first you know, citadels come in the next five years, right? <laughs> so people might have ways to go and set up their own little communities with, you know, additional security and additional other um, ways to try and separate themselves a little bit from all the crazies out there in the fiat world, right? <laughs> so that's um, part of it. I think yeah. I, I would hope to see, obviously, from a Bitcoin perspective, I hope we see, you know, much easier, you know, security and Hopefully, you know, we see a lot more development around things like Lightning Network and a lot more people are using that. And yeah, hopefully we see more work done on some of these other ideas like uh, some of the upstream dependencies of Bitcoin, things like, you know, how do you get that chain of trust, you know, things like geeks and things on that nature. I think that would be really cool to see. Um, I'm hopeful we get, you know, Schnorr and Taproot in and... Uh, and uh, by then, maybe people will be talking about like cross signature aggregation, cross input signature aggregation, uh, some of those aspects. I guess from a, that's I guess uh, the good side. Uh, I believe by then, I don't think it, it makes the government smaller in that time. In that time, it's probably a bit too optimistic. I think mm -hmm. we'll see the reduction in the size of the government. That that's more like fifteen, twenty years time. I, I could be wrong, maybe, yeah, but uh, I guess that's, mm -hmm. I guess I'm sort of painting out the scenario there where potentially the average person, it's easy for them to run their own Bitcoin node, it's easy for them to do multi signature, it's easy for them to use Lightning. Um, and right, by now, by then, so many more people are able to, you know, freely transact and freely save in Bitcoin. And that just really kicks off that whole network effect for the next. Um, kind of cycle, if you will. So I guess that for me is kind of the really optimistic bullish case. I would say the bearish case now, that might be something like, okay, again, I, I believe this is unlikely, but let's say government, huge government crackdown, or maybe, you know, Bitcoin gets driven into the, you know, into the underground. Maybe there's some, I don't know, maybe if there was, if there were to be some kind of, you know, break found or problem in the cryptography or something like that, I guess, I, I, I guess I'm kind of spec, like, obviously I don't think that, I don't think these are likely, right? Um, but I think mm -hmm. that, yeah, that could happen. I don't know. Maybe you see, you start to see more of this whole, oh, you know, quantum computing, blah, blah, blah. Right. But again, even there, <laughs> I think that's, even that is probably further off, even if it were to happen, right? The supposed, you know, quantum error corrected, whatever qubits. Again, I'm not, I don't, I'm not an expert, so I don't really know enough to say. I, maybe, maybe another bear case would be somehow, again, I, I don't see why, but let's imagine somehow we were wrong about hard money being better and somehow, you know, not people don't come <laughs> into Bitcoin and it just languishes off into the, you know, it just becomes whatever. That, even then, I think it would still have value from the permissionless sense, right? Um, so for me, I, I guess I'm trying to like maximize, I'm trying to sort of steel man the counter arguments or what would happen, what could, you know, <laughs> maybe, okay, maybe another one would be, let's say governments try to go after anyone who has Bitcoin, right? So they say, well, fine, we can't, mm. we can't stop you, but we want to track you. And so we go to every exchange and we say, hey, uh, I know Stefan Levera signed up with this exchange. Give me the records on exactly how many Bitcoins he bought and which address he sent them out to. And then we're going to go after him and say, hey, you better prove to us you have all these Bitcoins. Otherwise, you know, you owe us or oh, whatever, pound of flesh, whatever, right? <laughs> so I guess that's, if I'm trying to push it to the extreme, that's probably, that's probably about as bad as I can imagine. <laughs> Yeah, which which actually doesn't sound that bad to be honest, <laughs> uh, which, which is interesting. All right, so uh, with with respect to the nature of work, say Bitcoin catches fire, say twenty years from now, how do you think the nature of work changes as a result? So I think we're going to see a lot more smaller and medium enterprises. Uh, not to say big business is bad, right? It's just that we would see. Mm -hmm. I think right now they've been overrepresented. Um, because of fiat. Uh, in terms of bringing back to the nature of work, I think we are going to 
you know, imagine uh, in a world with so much more technological advancement, we are going to basically amplify the work of one person. One person can do the work of 10 or 100 or 1,000 or let's say in a very skilled computer programmer's case, probably that one person can do the work of, you know, a million people, right? Like if you're really scaling it out. Um, and so that means a lot of uh, a lot of automation might free us up to be more creative and to be more like a craftsman. Mm. We a lot of the auto, a lot of the kind of boring stuff will get automated away, and we, I think, should be optimistic. I think that is a world where we will be so much more productive. And I think the other aspect is we'll probably move towards you know the importance of human connection, right? Whereas I think, let me give a quick example. So imagine. Why is it that, let's say, a barber in you know a, a rich city earns more than a barber in a poorer city? Well, it's because usually it's because that barber has better alternatives, so you have to pay him better or her better um, mm. in order to get them to mm. do that job there. Mm. So I think it's going to be a similar effect where regardless of you know the the amount of skill or how high paying that job is, it we, we will start to see more things going towards that human connection so for example i think as over time people get more wealthy they might have more and more demand for say stand-up comics or uh, nannies or um, (laughs) private performances and things like that where people you know play music together or whatever and i think there's just going to be a lot more appreciation for those things because people will just have more overall wealth because less of it will be kind of sucked away by the government and fiat money um, and more of it will go to the individual. And then so we'll be living in a much more wealthy society. And as part of that, we'll be paying we, because we want that human connection. So those careers mm. uh, will take a corresponding rise because, you know, because and I think this is like the good counter argument against the people who say, oh, no, jobs are all getting automated away. And now, <laughs> you know, that's why we need a UBI because there'll be some people who just can't get a job. I, th- I think no, there will be many jobs that come. We just can't predict where they will show up. Very interesting. Yeah, I I, I could definitely see it where uh, because you're freed up from working as hard uh, or working as crazily that you focus a lot more on your relationships with other people and having experiences that bond you to together and uh, bond you together instead of uh, I don't know, like making work a little more efficient. And I, I, th- I for one, would definitely welcome a world like Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You're involved as a seed investor in Bitcoin. Uh, what, what's, uh, what's that about? And uh, what's your goal for that fund? Yeah, so that is Bitcoiner Ventures. And essentially, that is our attempt to try and push Bitcoin along this pathway. And so... Right now, that is an investment syndicate. It's available to globally, um, to uh, accredited investors, and it's through AngelList. So basically, people can sign up on there, and AngelList does the accreditation. Basically, you click through their form online. And essentially, what we're doing with Bitcoin Adventures is to give hodlers a way to contribute into Bitcoin businesses that they want to see. So our first deal was with Mm. Unchained Capital, as you know. And uh, so the idea is essentially that if you're a Bitcoin hodler, you probably also have a certain vision about how you want Bitcoin to be. And if you want certain things to be made or products and services to be made, well, then it's usually a good idea is to have a business that's doing that. And so this is one way you can help fund that and contribute into that and take an ownership stake in that. So typically, uh, we will get an allocation for a company and then offer that to the investors who are part of our syndicate. And so we, the partners, so that's myself, uh, Corey Clipston, Jan Pritzker, and Lewis, Lewis Liu, um, we take zero fees to us, right? So it is literally the only fees people pay are platform fees. So this is literally just something we're doing because we want there to be a way for, you know, for example, for my listeners, um, they want, if they want to contribute, then they can, you know, come and uh, sign up and become uh, an affiliate or uh, become uh, a part of the syndicate. 
Um, and so we're thinking potentially down the track, we may look into turning this into a proper like full fledged fund. Um, but for now, it's just an investor syndicate and it's a way for people to participate. And so right now, obviously, this is kind of because, you know, we're not getting paid for this. This is purely um, out of our own, you know, desire to see Bitcoin grow and to to strengthen Bitcoin in, in certain dimensions along certain pathways, whether that's, uh, you know, some business that's maybe helping in like a transactional sense of, you know, if it's like some lightning kind of business or whether it's an on-ramp business or maybe it's remittance, um, maybe it's, you know, some business that's assisting with mining, we, we, you know, these are things we're exploring. Um, but uh, we're, we're sort of on track to maybe do, we're looking at maybe three or four investments per year. We're not looking, we're not necessarily going to be the kind of first check for a company, um, for, a, for an entrepreneur or a founder. We're looking to help out a business that's Ideally, they've already got some revenue, uh, or they've got uh, yeah a, a business already running, and we might then enable uh, our you know investors as part of our syndicate to invest also. So that's kind of the 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 rundown there. Um, and let me just um, just get the website up. So yeah, so it's <laughs> bitcoinerventures.com. So anyone interested, you can find us there at bitcoinerventures.com, or obviously you can contact me, and we can. Um, get you uh into our syndicate if you're interested yeah and uh one, one of the attractive things about this sort of model is that uh if if a company is taking funding in this particular way they kind of have to answer to the community and less their vc like instead of like a particular vc who might have all sorts of all coin investments <laughs> and things like that which uh which I, I i certainly appreciate uh right you know instead of like if, say, for example, you invested in an exchange, uh, there would be a lot less pressure to list the uh, you know, latest IEO or something like that uh, and much more into, you know, go go and provide these Bitcoin services that are going to be more valuable for the long Exactly. Time. And it's Bitcoin only, of course. So, um, you know, we, we just didn't, didn't want to waste time with altcoins. And um, we I think our, you know, our members in the syndicate also appreciate that too all right so where can people find you stefan yeah so you can find me there's two main places stefan is the main one for my podcast and then the other one is ministry of nodes.com.au that's my other business where we just teach people how to do bitcoin that's me and katan um but yeah obviously you can find my podcast at stefan Levera podcast uh, and, and do you have any uh, plans for things that uh, from Ministry of Nodes that you want to tease the listeners on? So, yeah, we're working on a couple guides. We're looking at ways to try and make it easy for people uh, because there's a lot of chaff in the space, right? There's a lot of just random noise out there and it's hard to kind of find the signal. So we're going to try to operate and offer some guides and ways for new bitcoiners to learn how to secure their coins and run their bitcoin node and so on in a way that's kind of simple and saves them a lot of time right rather than spending hundreds or thousands of hours trying to learn how to do it you can just buy a guide from us and we'll, we'll and that will kind of take you through so that's that's something we're looking at we're working on at the moment there yeah, that that sounds a lot like uh, what you did with the podcast. You're scratching your own itch, almost like uh, you know, it's it's definitely something that is very annoying to do. And uh, you know, by by providing like a proper perspective, especially given your experience, that seems like something that uh, people may want. Yeah, I hope so. I hope so. And I think because um, one thing we've noticed also is that sometimes someone goes through the effort to make a guide, but then it's out of date in like six months. So potentially <laughs> what we're hope well, we'll see. Again, depends on how the the reception of our guide goes. But if we put this out and if people like it, then maybe we could commit to doing something like a yearly update on the guide. So we'll kind of look at, okay, the different options out there in the space. Based on that, what are the trade-offs? And try to blend that together into something that makes sense for the typical new coiner. And hopefully that is going to help them with the onboarding. Yeah, and that could be sort of like an evergreen publication that gets updated every six months or something with, uh, you know, the latest. I, I'd certainly want to use like Taproot for certain things uh, once it's activated rather than, uh, you know, the tech we have now if it's available. Right, yeah. 
All right. Well, thank you for joining us. Uh, this uh, I I didn't realize that this is how it would go, but uh, I mean, it, it was absolutely uh, delightful to be speaking with you. Yeah. Uh, anything else that you'd want to say to the listeners? Oh no! Look, I think uh, thanks for inviting me. I really enjoyed chatting with you, Jimmy, and uh, yeah, hope to chat soon. Well, that wraps it up for the first ever episode of Bitcoin Fixes This. As he said. Stefan can be found at stefanlevera.com and ministryofnodes.com.au. Until next time, fiat delenda est.